Washington Journal continues. Our first segment of the morning takes a look at education policy. Neil McCluskey from Cato Institute joining us as our guest. He's the Associate Director of the Center for Educational Freedom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? We're uh, fine, thank you. We're here to talk about something known as Common Core. Now, for mm -hmm. those who may not be as following as closely as you are, how would you define Common Core? What is it? Sure. Well, there are actually arguments about Common Core, but one thing I think everyone can agree on is these are, at the very least, standards that have been established for math and reading, and they were created under the auspices of the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers, which are kind of professional organizations of governors and state superintendents. We also, I think everybody agrees, that the federal government, through Race to the Top, which was $4.35 billion in the stimulus, said to states, if you want to get maximum points in this competition for money, you really have to adopt the Common Core. Now, the term they used were standards that were common to a majority of states. There was only one set of standards that met that definition, mm -hmm. and that was Common Core. And the other thing I think most people agree on is this was further advanced by the federal government. They said if you want a waiver from the No Child Left Behind Act, you really have two choices. One is Common Core. The other is you have a network of public college and university in your state certify your own standards as college and career ready. Importantly, this happened after Race to the Top when most states said, look, we're going to use the Common Core. So as far as what it actually does, how does that work on a year-to-year -year basis in schools? Right. Well, so far, all we've been doing is implementation. So uh, really starting in 2010, states said, OK, we're going to implement this thing. About a year and a half ago, it hit districts and schools, which is when most people became aware of it. Um, and then next year, you're supposed to see the testing meaningful testing of this. So you have states right now that are doing, uh, you'd say, test testing, if there's such a term. Mm -hmm. um, so they're trying it out. Uh, but that's when it really gets implemented, is when you see those tests that count for accountability, ultimately, to the federal government. Oh, is there a, was anything wrong with that approach? Yeah, there are a lot of problems with that approach. First of all, all kids are different. And the direction this takes us in is to say, but everybody should do the same thing at the same time, at least in math and reading. That, that ignores basic reality of, of human beings. Different kids learn different things at different times. Mm -hmm. You also have a big problem of you want to have different ideas of what is the best standard. You want those to be able to compete. When you have one national standard, you don't get that competition anymore. So if Common Core doesn't work well, or even if it works well and there are always things that can be improved, we're not going to know how to do that because we won't have this competition. And then finally, the federal government has gotten heavily involved in this and centralization ultimately tends to be controlled not by parents it's supposed to serve or kids or respond to them the way it should, but it's, it's centralized. Often special interests control it, but even worse, you have people in Washington trying to tell every community, no matter how different, how they should run their schools. Now, you said as far as the curriculum is concerned, does that mean every state can develop their own curriculum under the umbrella of Common Core? Yeah, and that's a, another interesting question, and there's disagreement on this. So there's no disagreement that these are supposed to be standards. And the argument uh, or the idea of standards is, well, they're going to tell you what you need to be able to do, not how you do it. So people, everyone agrees it has that goal. There's disagreement whether it's curriculum. So, for instance, if you look at the math, it doesn't just say you should be able to multiply multi-digit numbers. It says how you should be able to do it. So you have to be able to do things like use area models and other ways of multiplying. So it becomes very murky whether or not you're talking about curriculum or not when you talk about these standards. And of course, I don't think anybody disagrees that the point of the standards is ultimately put a box around your curriculum. What can you do and what can't you do? What happens to a school who takes the money, sets up the standards, if they do well or if they don't do well? What would happen to the school in question? Yeah, so if they use the standards, we now have, through these waivers, we've moved away from what was the old No Child Left Behind model, where uh, you were evaluated as a school based on whether this year's fourth graders did better than last year's fourth graders. Common Core is part of this overall uh, change in federal policy that started with Race to the Top and is part of waivers, where you still have schools that will be held accountable based on their test scores. There is a little more leeway in how states would say, you know, you, are, you have to use just test scores or you have other measures. 
But if you are in the lower 5% or 10% of schools, you are still going to be punished or at least put on a path you may not want to go on based on those test scores. I was going to ask as far as the differences between this and No Child Left Behind, were you supportive of No Child Left Behind? Uh, I wasn't. No Child Left Behind represented an increase in federal power from what used to be. So and what No Child Left Behind did is said, look states, we are going to now require that you have state standards, state tests, that you put all your schools on a trajectory to reach full proficiency. Every child supposedly proficient in 2014, so the end of this academic year. And it was, first of all, unconstitutional. Federal government doesn't have constitutional authority to do any of these things. But it became what, what you'd expect, which is that instead of setting high bars, most states set low bars and did everything they could to call it proficiency, but not actually hit anything meaningfully called proficiency. Common Core was supposed to change this by saying, well, okay, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna force you all to use the same standards and the same tests and the same definition of proficiency so that you can't hide these things. And what it ignores is you have the same political pressures at a local government, a district, which is local government monopoly, a state government monopoly, or at the federal government, which is most of the impetus will be, say, to make this easier. Meanwhile, you ignore the fact, both with No Child Left Behind and Common Core, that all communities are different, all schools are different, and most importantly, all kids are different. The topic Common Core and education policy here in the United States. Our guest, Neil McCluskey of Cato Institute. If you want to ask him questions about it, 202-585-3880 is a line we've set aside for parents this morning. If you're a teacher, 202-585-3881 and all others involved, 202-585-3882. How many people have signed up or how many states have signed up for Common Core? Well, so he had 45 states that had signed up. Plus, Minnesota had taken one of the standards. I think it was the reading and not the math. I always forget which one it is. But they took sort of half of it. What you've seen, though, now is the state of Indiana earlier this month mm -hmm. pulled out. That was the first state that had said it would use Common Core and officially left. Oklahoma is on the verge of that. So they've passed legislation in both the House and their Senate, but let's go back to the House. South Carolina just passed something a few days ago. Saying, Have they given reasons, these states? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that, that people dislike the core. A lot of pe reasons people do like the core. And it's hard to pin down exactly what it is. Clearly in Indiana, part of the reason they pulled out is they said, look, Indiana can set its own standards. And Indiana actually had a very highly rated set of standards before Common Core. So they said, this isn't something the federal government should be telling us to do. And you see that in a lot of states. There are many people, though, who say these aren't very good standards. They say, look, they're not internationally benchmarked the way you'd think that the top reforming nations, these are the same thing. And they say we can do better in terms of standards. So there are lots of federalism questions, governance questions, and quality questions that have caused people to to resist the core. So we had a guest on last week talking about this same topic, Michael Petrelli of the Thomas Fordham Institute. He was taking the position about Common Core. Um, they were created by the states. They were on their own, no outside influences from the federal government. I want you to listen to his thoughts, get you to respond to it. Mm -hmm. but in fact, it, this was something that the states did on their own. It started long before President Barack Obama was even in office. Now, it is true that after this process had gotten started, after the states had started working together on these common standards, the federal government then, through Barack Obama, put forward some very strong incentives for the states to sign up. Uh, but this very much started in the states and is now really being run back at the state level, and that's where the debate is. It started the states and run back at the state level, that's what he says. Yeah, so there are a few things we need to, to deal with here about the reality of what actually happened. So the National Governors Association, the Council of Chief State School Officers, they are professional organizations of governors and state superintendents. These don't represent states. I bet you couldn't find anybody in any state who said, you know why I voted for X, Y, or Z for governor is because I wanted, I was really wanted to know what they're going to do in the National Governors Association. The fact of the matter is, what they do has no bearing directly on states, and people are represented, their states are, in, in the federal government, through their elected representatives in Congress, and your legislatures and states. So these are not states. They may be state officials, but they don't officially represent states. I think the even more important part about this, though, is it was not intended to be state or voluntary for states, even from the NGA and CCSSO. So in 2008, they put out a report called Benchmarking for Success. 
and note that that's before there was an Obama administration. And this report was saying states, you should get onto a common set of internationally benchmarked standards. Just before they called it Common Core, but that is what Common Core is. And they said the federal government has a job to incentivize adoption of these things through funding, which is what Race to the Top ultimately was, and regulatory relief, which is what No Child Left Behind waivers were. So they intended for the federal government to be a driving force behind this. And you can understand why, actually, when you read material from the Fordham, the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, where Mike Petrilli is from, where they've said for sort of top-down standards to work, and I don't think they're working with this, but for it to work, they said you have to have a tripod, which is you have to have common standards, common tests, and common punishments for, or repercussions if you don't do well, and that mm -hmm. makes sense. Same material, same metric of how you're doing on the material, and then you can't escape accountability by saying we won't hold ourselves accountable. And there's, they didn't think states would do this, and there's a lot of evidence that states won't. There's only one entity that has authority over states, or takes authority over states, that could do this, and that is the federal government. So it's almost impossible to believe that there wasn't an intention behind this to have the federal government involved long before there was an, o an Obama administration. How do we get to this government co-opting these plans that were designed by outside bodies? Well, I would say they didn't co-opt it. I think that this is something that was clearly called for by the NGA and CCSSO, and you can look at that 2008 report, Benchmarking for Success, and that's clear. And there, there's some uh, reason to believe that the administration got the stimulus, and Race to the Top was just a small part of that, mm -hmm. you know, 800 some billion dollars for the stimulus, 4.35 billion for this Race to the Top. And it was basically a blank slate. The Secretary of Education could, could do whatever he wanted with it. And it, it's pretty clear, although I wasn't in these meetings, because I'm not a supporter of national standards, but that national standards supporters were saying, look, something that you should push through this program is national standards. And if you look at the timeline, Common Core was officially established as something that was going to be created at almost the exact same time. And the uh, Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, at the time of the stimulus was saying, look, this is something I think we should do with it, is have these national standards. So if you put it all together, both what the NGA and CCSSO explicitly asked for, and you look at the timeline of what actually happened with the Race to the Top, it, it's very clear that this was something that was being pushed all along before there was an Obama administration and while the Obama administration was putting together Race to the Top. Neil McCluskey from the Cato Institute joining us to talk about Common Core. First call up is John from Michigan on our Others line. John, good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I guess my first uh, thought would be is uh, that we need... Hello? Go ahead. You're on. Um, we need to get back to the basics in education. I'm an old timer, and uh, I I believe that reading, writing, arithmetic are the basics. That's where we need to focus our education. First one, reading. If you can't read, you can't do any other subject. We should point to that first of all. My next comment would be on the monies that go into education. Now, when the federal government gets into anything, you see a lot of waste. Where I see a lot of waste in K through 12 education is the 25% of the monies that go into that go into intermediate education, which only makes up about two percent of the population. Thank you, caller. Yeah, well, I think that these are all really important points, and so I'm going to try and, try and get to them all as quickly as I can. I think that, first of all, you talk about the three R's, and I think a lot of people agree that that's an important part of education. Um, the interesting thing about the quality of the Common Core is there's, you're getting sort of different messages about whether it's focusing on basics, on the three R's, or whether it's focusing on something that's uh, more fuzzy, maybe important, but definitely fuzzy, and that's the idea of critical thinking. And I think this has been a lot of the problem with the Common Core 
and the debate around it, especially the quality, is what really is it supposed to be? Now, I'd recommend that everybody read the Common Core standards, um, and you can go to, I think it's commoncore.org, but just Google them and you can find them, uh, and see what they have. I think you'll find that they are far more nebulous than we're led to believe. Um, as far as the federal money goes, this is really important. When you have any sort of centralization, and if you're talking about basically one government trying to run 100,000 um, schools and about 4,000 school districts, of course there's going to be massive bureaucracy because the only way you can try and run that is through bureaucratic control, and that means waste. And then I think it's also really important if we're going to talk about both the federal government and the three R's, and ultimately what we want out of education, is there is no meaningful empirical evidence that having national standards leads to better outcomes. This was a debate we didn't even get to have because Race to the Top basically told states before Common Core was even fully or finally published, the final version came out, they said, you need to adopt these to compete for Race to the Top money. So we never even got to have the debate about whether national standardization leads to better outcomes. The evidence says it doesn't, but we didn't even get to talk about that. Dave, up next, from Illinois. He's a parent. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my question is, my um, uh, kids' teachers have been complaining about the constant testing, that um, are states and local districts adapting to, um, you know, eliminating what they already do and making it into one test. They said they'd take tests all year long. Yeah, so the first thing I should say is there is some separation between the Common Core and the testing. It's not meaningful, I don't think, but the Common Core it refers to just the standards. So those standards were pushed in two, again, federal policies, race to the top and waivers, which also then said you must do testing, there must be accountability based on these testing. It also had some teacher quality things and, and, and other elements. So it's part of a broader, uh, you'd say more comprehensive federal policy. So it does, through race to the top and waivers, require that you have testing. It doesn't necessarily require that you do testing every three months or something like that. Now, the federal government paid for two tests that, are, that come from consortia of states, PARC and SBAC. And, and the, the latter has tests you can take as sort of diagnostics throughout the year. Um, you do see school districts using other tests as well. They may use Terra Nova. They may use Stanford 10, different types of tests. So I think the fairest thing to say is that Common Core itself doesn't require any testing. Common Core came, though, very explicitly in federal policy that did link it to tests. But districts are also sometimes on their own, sometimes required by sta states, adding testing in addition to that, and that's up to them. Uh, our guest is with the Cato Institute, but in his past career you taught high school English. Yes. Um, you know, very briefly, just a couple of years. And, and really, what I learned teaching doesn't inform what I'm saying in Common Core, which is largely research-based and just fact base, but teaching for a couple years did teach me how difficult the job is and how truly different different kids are, how they learn at different rates, and how you can amazingly, you'll have a child or a student who, uh, you know, for, for a while is struggling. You can see them one year really having a hard time, then something like clicks over the summer, and they're a totally different person. And this is I think why it's so important we not think that you can just have one central lockstep standard and have optimum outcome. It just doesn't make sense when you know how different all kids truly are from each other. So you taught under no federal type of standard like a Common Core, like a No Child Left Behind, that kind of thing? No, I was in a parochial school, and parochial schools are, weren't required to do any testing. Now, things have changed since I was there uh, teaching. Uh, and even with Common Core, you have seen some Catholic schools say, look, we're going to take the Common Core, at least some part of it. And this is really leads to a, a kind of important point, which is we tend to think that homeschoolers and private schoolers won't be affected by the Common Core. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the, the total number of students or, or school-aged population, over 70 percent, if you include kids who are in public schools and states that are using the Common Core, over 70 percent of those school-aged students are subject to the Common Core. And that's going to lead to crowding out of the tests that are available, the textbooks that are available. And this is going to impact private schools and homeschoolers, whether they like it or not. You've already seen the SAT say 
it's going to align with the Common Core, the ACT saying it is aligned with the Common Core, and these are the two main uh, college uh, entrance exams that people take. So uh, the GED, which is the, the equivalency to, to a high school diploma, that's being aligned to Common Core. So if you're at all involved in education, this is going to impact you. There's no way to escape it because it's so big. Let's hear from a teacher. This is Jackie from Columbia, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good morning, go ahead. Good. Um, I, um, <clears throat> number one, I believe, the gentleman said the three R's, absolutely, I teach math, but I believe also that there needs to be a common standard, and I don't think there's anything wrong with the common core state standards, I think. What's wrong with what's happened with common core is the implementation has been horrible. Um, because students, as the gentleman said earlier, the, some state standards, some states have had very low standards so that their school system could look really good. Maryland's one of them. And when the Common Core came along, it exposed the fact that there were a lot of schools with very low standards or expectations of their children. Now, there has, never been, there has not been any adjustment to the fact that if you expect a fourth grader to understand fractions, which is what they're going to have to do, there is no acknowledgement that there was no readiness for that for the students who came, you know, the students below fourth grade who are now going to face the Common Core standards. The teachers in the elementary school are not ready to teach um, the, the, to the level of the Common Core state standards, and none of them really are. And so ramping everybody up and expecting everyone to be ready um, when this is totally new is is Im to me ri ridiculous. So um, Jackie, do you have a sense of how your teaching will change once these standards go into full implementation? My standards have not changed. I've always challenged my students. The problem is the level at which they want the students to be, the students aren't ready. So for example, I teach seventh grade math. Um, my students in, in Baltimore City, their ranges go from second grade level capacity, you know, where they, where they understand math on a second grade level, up to students who are ready to take ninth grade level, and I'm teaching them all in the same room. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot expect, and then the, the Common Core took what used to be called uh, ninth grade level math, and now they brought it down to sixth and seventh grade level math, and some in eighth grade. The kids aren't ready for it, so they're teach they want them to, to be able to do algebra, but they're not ready for it yet. It's not that they can't do it. They're just not ready. They haven't been prepared. It's going to take years before the adjustment can be made, and there's been no acknowledgment of that. And Jackie. so now they're, next year they're going to talk about testing the kids, and they're not ready. Thank this you, Jackie. I appreciate the input this morning. I really do. Go ahead. Yeah, well, this is a huge problem that Common Core has had is the implementation. Um, and a lot of that is because this was something that was driven by the federal government. And states really had no choice. If they wanted this race to the top money, if they want to get out of No Child Left Behind, which almost everybody seems to agree was a failure, they had to adopt these standards, and they had to adopt the federal timeline to adopt the standards, implement the testing, um, and that was all very much rushed. And it, I think it was in part rushed because they didn't want states to be able to back out of this after they'd had the time to have some debate. Now, most states didn't have any debate or any meaningful debate before they adopted these because, again, the federal government said, you need to promise to adopt these before they're even written. And what happened, I think, ended up surprising a, a lot of supporters of the Common Core was they saw states certainly go through uh, the implementation process, but then when it hit districts about a year, a year and a half ago, suddenly there was huge resistance to this. And there was huge resistance because schools and districts and parents were suddenly being confronted with something they didn't know anything about. And in many cases, they didn't think it made sense, just like, uh, Jackie, like you're talking about. Um, and, and ordinarily, if a state were going to change standards, you would have had a lot of time for debate, for different people to get to know what was in there, to talk about what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And all that was short-circuited. And you see, particularly actually in New York, which was a, a state that adopted the standards and got out ahead of other states and said, we're going to test this on our own. Well, the, when they tested it and the results came out about a year ago, they tested it longer than a year ago, but the results came out a year ago, there was complete turmoil in New York because they saw proficiency rates 
dropped by about a third. And everybody said, how is this possible? Where did this come from? Why are you suddenly telling us our kids are not proficient? when they were before and a lot of it was implementation because they were in many cases using new tests with the old curriculum because everybody was scrambling to get it implemented and i think that the, the the main impetus for this was because the federal government said adopt these things adopt testing and do it right now so to that point there may not be exact an exact answer for this but this is still off of twitter saying how many days of testing will common core involved how many months have devoted to teaching towards the testing yeah and that we don't know, and that could vary from district to district and state to state. And there have been some assessments trying to say, well, how long will you have to spend on testing? Uh, how long should you spend on it? How long have states spent on testing till now? And, and let's be clear, testing has been something that's gone on before Common Core. I don't want to give the impression it started it. We heard about these issues, No Child Left Behind. Yeah, though. No Child Left Behind said you have to have standards, you have to have tests. But these Common Core tests are supposed to be longer because they're supposed to be more in-depth. They're supposed to be more, rather than just multiple choice, sort of uh, free writing and, and things like that, or, or at least beyond multiple choice. It takes more uh, time to grade. And so the test will be longer, but a district may just want to do, well, or the state typically runs this, but so state, unless they give districts authority to do it on their own, may just want to do common core testing, in which case they, they don't have to spend as much time as they might think. If they continue to do other kind of tests, which are different, so the Terranovas and the Stanford 10s or the Iowa tests, then that's going to add to their time testing. And, and it's also important to understand that, that one of these, the park, you could do a paper test, or you could do it online. SBAC also is online. Um, and that leads to lots of questions about do you have the technology to do it? How are you going to have every kid have access to a computer? Does that mean you have a longer testing window, even though each child might not spend as much time? So there's a lot of play in the numbers of how much testing and how long. Neil McCluskey from Cato Institute joining us. Our next call comes from Daniel. Daniel is from Maryland on our other's line. Hello, Daniel. Good morning. Go ahead. Good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, yeah, I, I'm so happy that we're, we're talking about this. Um, first of all, I think this is, you know, a, a huge issue that, um, you know, personally I haven't seen so much uh, coverage or media information about this kind of thing. Um, and I, so I think that this kind of thing was kind of rushed, rushed through and uh, states and schools weren't able to kind of give feedback as to, you know, how they'd be able to do this or if this is something they actually want to do. Um, and so now you're seeing this kind of problems of, of schools and, and, and what you've already mentioned and, and what the teacher, you know, prior caller mentioned. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I definitely think that, uh, you know, this is kind of a fundamental question of, of government. You know, do we want the government to just kind of uh, rush and implement something and just kind of off the bat do it like this? Or do we want more uh, localized efforts for for the students? And if you look at the at the environment for for students, it's it's very personalized. It's not like a, you know, every 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 child fits one size. Every child is different. And so I think it's it's very very difficult for you know a, a massive bureaucracy like the federal government to implement this kind of thing and throw money. And so then schools feel obligated to to comply with those standards and. Oh. and it just turns into a big mess. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, I think this is, a, again, an excellent point, which is that Common Core has sort of snuck up on the public. And I think, again, this was largely a, a function of the federal government, uh, I think, prodded very clearly. I mean, uh, there's no question in benchmarking for success, the 2008 report, the CCSSO and NGA said, federal government, you'll incentivize this. And I think there were a lot of people, when Race to the Top was first created, imploring the Secretary of Education to include uh, um, coercion to adopt national standards as part of Race to the Top. And it was all kept, I think, very quiet because at the time, remember, most people were focusing on the, the Great Recession and we're really at the low point of the Great Recession. Um, and so that's why we don't see people suddenly becoming aware of Common Core until about a year and a half ago when it actually hit implementation level of districts and schools and people said, what is this? Where did it come from? What's in it? Why do we have to use this? And if you look at polling, it's still around 60% of people who say, they've never even heard of the Common Core. And, and this is something that is supposed to transform, if you listen to supporters of Common Core, it's supposed to transform in many ways American education. Well, if you're going to try and do something that's transformative, 
you certainly need to have a lot of public debate, and we never had that. And I think that's what's part of what's fueling opposition to this, and, and sometimes kind of angry opposition, is that people feel like this was foisted on them and they had no say in it. So Jan Ness asked a question, shouldn't students learn the same stuff so they're on the same page when they get to college? Yeah, well, so this is, this is part of the problem, is again, all people are different. So I certainly understand why people say, look, you're in Mississippi or you're in Massachusetts. You should all be learning the same thing. You don't want to shortchange someone just because based on where you live. But the fact of the matter is, some people want to become engineers, and they're really good at what it takes to become an engineer. They should be on a totally different path, or, or largely different path, than somebody who, you know, like me, was an English major. I'm going to be doing different things. I probably am better at, at, at English than I am at science or mathematics. Maybe that engineering major is better at science than they are at uh, writing an essay. And so being college ready actually is a different thing for different people, largely depending on what you want to go into. And then some people may want to go into a vocation. They should be on a different track to best enable them to do what they want to do. So it sounds certainly equitable to say everybody should be doing the same thing at the same time until you realize all kids, all people are different and therefore shouldn't be doing the same thing at the same time and in many cases can't because they have different things that they're good at or not good at or they want to do. Stacy from Louisiana, a parent, good morning. Stacy, good morning, go ahead. Yes, I was calling about, I was wondering, what about kids that do well during the school year and whenever it's time for testing and they, does, they don't do well, are they held accountable by being held back that school year if they're going into high school? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, that depends on your state. So different states have different uh, ramifications for students, depending on how they do. So uh, for many states, if you don't do well on a Common Core aligned test, it doesn't mean anything for the student. In other states, they may have this aligned to Common Core. They may have their own exams. There are states where they say, if you want to graduate or if you're going to advance from one grade to another, you have to get a passing test score on tests. The Common Core, though, doesn't require this, or I should say the Common Core, in, as part of Race to the Top or waivers, doesn't say these need to be high stakes for students. They are, though, high stakes for schools and districts. And so that actually leads to a, an alignment of incentives problem that I think a lot of teachers and schools are aware of, where if you don't have meaningful ramifications for the students, they might not take a test as seriously as you'd like them to, and that's a big problem if the school or district is held accountable for those results. Uh, the, the Wall Street Journal this morning has a story taking a look at Race to the Top, states that have received education grants showing how much their reading uh, proficiency has have changed. In the fourth grade, students in Maryland saw a jump of six points, in Washington, four points, also in Hawaii and Georgia. Rhode Island and New York and Delaware saw nothing decreases in Ohio and Massachusetts. In the eighth grade, increases in almost every state, including a seven-point jump in Rhode Island, and these are the 12 states that received Race to the Top grants. Is right. it working? Yeah, the problem is you can't make any connection with this to Race to the Top. So you've got to understand that Race to the Top is, in most cases, still being implemented. So when you got the money, you had a four-year horizon to put this together. And in many cases, that's been extended. We have seen, depending on the, the grade, we've seen increases over time in National Assessment of Educational Progress scores. It's been impossible to, to connect that to Race to the Top. It's been impossible to connect it to No Child Left Behind. And what we've seen is, if you look historically at the long-term trends NAEP, and they're really two different NAEPs, one is not long-term trend, and it changes all the time. The other is from the early 70s. And it's supposed to be a constant test. So you can say 70s equivalent to 2000s. What we've seen in that is you have ups and downs regardless of policy. And then when you get to high school, so 12th graders, absolutely flat for well over four decades, which means none of this is sticking. So it's, it's impossible to say race to the top is causing anything in particular right now because it's still being implemented. And the fact is if you look at our best NAEP, the long-term trends, for the final product of our schools, if you want to call it that, the high school seniors, mm -hmm. none of this ultimately seems to work. And that's consistent with what uh, people across the spectrum have said about why Common Core won't work. So these are education analysts. They've said, look, we've seen state standards, and the state standards have almost no impact on outcomes. 
So there's no reason to expect that national standards will. A teacher joins us from Tennessee. This is Gary. Hello. Yeah, before I, before I get to my point about, um, you know, any sort of uh, pilot program for Common Core, I'd, I'd like to say that diversity is the genius for innovation. I'm owner of an engineering company. Uh, you have people with different insights. They can look at different problems differently. That's how you innovate. So having everybody be the same in our country would be suicide for entrepreneurship and innovation. Plus, I've never seen a pilot program for Common Core. Why are we going to stand the entire education system of our country on its ear for a program that's never been vetted or piloted? Yeah, that is a, an excellent point. It's one that we've heard many times, which is that Common Core was given to us. We're told it's internationally benchmarked, and that's all we're supposed to rely on. It hasn't ever been pilot tested. No one has said, let's try this in a district or a state. And of course, this is really an important point, that states in our federalist system are supposed to be laboratories of democracy, where one or two states can try something, and then if it doesn't work, other states aren't taken down with them. So they can try it, see if it works. Other states, if they like it, they can try it, they can adjust it. But this is a fundamental protection. You know, one of the reasons we tell people to diversify when they invest is so you don't have, you know, to use the cliche, all your eggs in one basket. Because if you're wrong, everything goes down. That's why we want to have competing standards. We don't want states to all be coerced to use the same thing. Because if it's wrong, we all go down. And even if it isn't that bad, we don't see what's better because we don't have competition. And of course, you're right that there are different ways to look at different problems, and there isn't one solution to, to many problems, and we need to let that diversity thrive, not you know, suffocate it. Uh, that was Gary. Ernestine is up next. Ernestine is from Oak Hill, West Virginia, on our Others Line. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Um, I'm I, the guest speaker is saying that every child is different. I did not teach children. I taught um, adults in uh, hospitals who wanted to um, advance in their career in food service. I had one student who knew the work, the work stem to stern, but when it came to testing, she could not equate what she learned to the test. She knew it when I asked her when she did the um, material to for the course, and this course was through Penn State. Uh, she knew it, but testing was her downfall. And so this is what I'm wondering what's going to happen when kids cannot, they fail to really understand the test. Because you're saying everybody is different, and that's what I, I saw in my work with adults uh, taking tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so the, the, the ramifications uh, for this are going to vary again from state to state. So in some cases, it's going to have uh, immediate impact on the student, and some it's just going to be the school and or the district. Um, but it, this is absolutely an important point, is that we need to understand that even when it comes to test taking, some people have different responses to taking a test than other people. And we also need to, to recognize that just conditions of a test will be different from day to day. So you'll have some kids who aren't feeling well on some days. You might have a, a situation where, you know, it's a, it's a really cold room for some kids or it's too warm for other kids. And then a really serious concern that I think people uh, across the board, whether you like Common Core or not, have is that these tests that are connected to Common Core through Race to the Top and waivers, so much of it is supposed to be online, will states have the technological ability and the bandwidth to execute these tests where you don't have kids who are suddenly you know, unable to access the test or the computer breaks down in the middle of the test uh, or you know, kids might have trouble typing. Uh, and so there are really big issues and big concerns I think across the board about how you're even going to implement these tests so that it's fair, understanding that the conditions when it's online could change uh, a lot pretty drastically because of technology. One of the people weighing in on Common Core is the National Urban League. They sent out a tweet that said this, only 16% of black students read at or above grade level compared to 44% of whites students. Is there a racial component uh, to this kind of testing and the program overall? 
Well, I mean, certainly a lot of this is driven by the idea, and I think it's, it's well-intentioned that, look, there, there are some uh, groups of people and some schools that, that aren't doing as well, and we want to find a way to deliver education where we can see who those people are and improve things for them. The problem is we've tried this from a top-down uh, uh, approach for a long time. No Child Left Behind did that, and, and generally it's considered a failure. I mean, if you look at test scores, again, those 12th grade scores are totally flat. And we actually saw bigger increases at times that weren't No Child Left Behind. Um, and what I think we ultimately need is to move to a system where you can personalize education as much as possible, because ultimately, a child may belong to a group, but they are not that group. In fact, we all belong to lots of different groups. And you want to be able to tailor education to the individual student, not based on their race, or their religion, or their economic status, but on what they need. And this doesn't do that. This says, well, everybody is essentially the same, and we're going to treat them as if they were identical. Is there an effective way, though, to cater to a classroom of unique students, then? Well, that, that ultimately gets to going in the opposite direction of what we've done. So we've gone to greater and greater centralization. What we need is to go to more and more decentralization. Now, I think that means school choice. You attach money to a student, and you let them choose a school, and you give the educators the people actually with the students, the freedom to start different schools, to try different things, and you let unique subsets of kids find schools that are geared to their unique needs. That's what we need. We also, though, see, we see the beginning of, thanks to technology, things like course choice, where you can, if you're in a school that doesn't offer you know, a particular course you may want, maybe because there are not enough other kids in that school mm -hmm. that want it or need it, you can go online. And you can get a bunch of kids from around the state, maybe, or it could be around the country, who want that course and they can get it. So that's what we need to focus on, is decentralization of the provision of education and allowing people to find what's best for their unique child. And to get away, I think, from saying, well, each child is whatever group we happen to think is most important. That's them. It isn't. All kids are unique. How do charter schools fit into that? Well, charter schools are an effort within the public schooling system to get these more unique schools that can focus on, on unique subsets of kids or offer different programs that the public, that traditional public schools can't. So a charter school, for people don't know, is a public school that is authorized to operate by some public entity. Usually it's a school district. In some states it can be a public college or university. Um, and so it's an ostensibly private entity then that runs it. The important point to understand for Common Core, though, is Common Core eliminates a great deal of that ability to be, uh, to be unique because, and I should say this really came with No Child Left Behind because No Child Left Behind said all public schools have to use state standards and state tests. Mm -hmm. And now the Common Core has said actually everybody, regardless of your state, has to use one standard and one test. And that means charters, to a large extent, can't be different because they are going to be held accountable to the exact same standards and tests as everybody else. And so the charter idea was going in the right direction, and there's certainly, I mean, there's still some things they can do differently, but we're taking away even that, both with the federal government telling states you have to have state standards and tests, and now telling them specifically what those must be. From Taylor's South Carolina, this is Daniel, and he's a teacher. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. My question really lies in the area of jurisdiction and uh, following on what you've been saying here. When you go back to the Tenth Amendment and then even the Department of Education Formation Act of 1979 written in there is the language that the federal government should not have control or mandate curriculum. You go to No Child Left Behind and there are actually four areas mentioned there, curriculum, assessment, teacher certification, and then also um, a fourth area of uh, student database. And yet it seems in each one of these areas there have been federal um, uh, inroads to those with InBloom for the national database. You've got the national teacher certification going on. You have national uh, assessment with Smarter Balanced and the PARC consortiums. So my question really is, uh, in, in essence, the federal government has essentially ignored the, these um, policies. What is the road back? Uh, how do we break this and, and 
get this back to where it ought to be with the states and the local education agencies. All right. Well, the first thing I'd say is that the federal government doesn't have constitutional authority to do any of this, regardless of what has been written in subsequent statute. The federal government can only do what's in the specific enumerated powers in the Constitution. Education isn't in there. Um, and this actually leads us to our solution. One is you, you need to have voters who vote on people based on their saying, look, I'm going to actually follow the Constitution. What powers are given the federal government? I'm not going to take ones that aren't. But, but the way that the federal government has done this is they can't just dictate to your state, say, look, you're going to have these standards and tests unless they offer the money. And that's what they've done for a very long time, is if you are going to follow state rules, I mean, I mean federal rules, it's because you've taken federal money. Now, that's why you have Common Core supporters who say this is voluntary. They say if states don't want to do it, they don't have to take the money. But we have to remember, one, that taxpayers who live in states had no choice about paying those taxes to begin with. And then this is often a very large amount of money, especially once you talk about No Child Left Behind, where you're talking about annual appropriations of, for some states, over a billion dollars. That's a lot of money to have to expect uh, state legislators to say, OK, I'm going to turn down you know, that billion dollars that came from my taxpayers to begin with, because I want to be able to run my own system. And let's be clear, this means it is de facto required. And the interesting thing is Common Core supporters will often say, oh, it's voluntary whether you take this because you don't have to take the money. Well, they could say the same thing about No Child Left Behind. If you turn down all that federal money, you, know, it's, it, you don't have to follow the rules. But they know that it's totally irrational to expect that any state's going to turn down that much money. And so what has to happen is people recognize that the federal government is essentially buying compliance but with taxpayer money that the taxpayers had no choice but to turn over to begin with. Bonnie from Maryland, parent, uh, parent, good morning. Hi, um, you know, it's, you're getting a lot of information on here and thank you for taking my call. Um, you know, I have two children, a daughter that's already graduated in 2009 and then my son is currently in eighth grade. Um, he's a, uh, an IEP, um, child and he has ADHD. You know, my concern is, again, that, you know, they're trying to push this common or across the board. You have children that have needs that, you know, like you said, you have one person that wants to be an engineer, the other person, you know, um, can't comprehend or can't get to that level. Um, and it's bad because the um, responsibility goes back to the teachers. And thank God that the um, the teachers that, you know, both my kids have dealt with have gone over and above what their, um, you know, requirements are in order to help these children. And, you know, it makes it hard for them because of the fact that they're having to go in order to get this funding. They have to go by what's required of them, you know. And so in a sense, each child, you know, may or may not be left behind. You know, so what do we do to, to change this? Yeah, those are great points, and I think that the first thing that people have to do is they have to be very clear, I think, when they're voting and when they're talking to their elected representatives to say, we don't want the federal government putting these requirements on us, acting as if all kids are identical. But we also have to recognize that this happens at the state level and often at the local level, especially if you're talking about very big districts. So you think about, for instance, New York City's over a million kids. That is a huge district, bigger than many states. Um, and so ultimately what has to happen is I think we really need to empower parents and that means you connect the money to a child and let them decide where they go. Um, but certainly short of that, it's much better to say, look, at least let local communities make these decisions. Give schools, the public schools, autonomy uh, that serve their district. Give them autonomy to do what they think is best for their unique population of students. But I think until uh, you, you see a popular uh, outcry to, to elected representatives saying we are tired of having this dictated to us, it's not going to change. I think one of the, the, the good things with Common Core and the reaction to it is you now have a very grassroots driven opposition to it, including a lot of teachers who may actually like the quality of the Common Core but hate the lockstep accountability that goes with it. 
sort of meeting up with people who, who are big supporters of federalism and want local control, and they're all saying, we're tired of having this uh, things imposed on us when we know it doesn't make sense. So maybe we're seeing a movement in the right direction. We have two years left in this administration, but what's the long-term impact of what's happening now with Common Core? Well, that's a really good question. So, uh, like I said, one of the drivers, the thing that really got states hooked on Common Core was race to the top. But that was really kind of a one-shot deal. What has kept states on, even ones that didn't win, are the waivers. The waivers were only able really to get traction because Congress can't agree on what to do with No Child Left Behind. Everybody knows they don't like it. They can't figure out how they want to change it. So whether or not we stay with these waivers that have really locked states in depends on whether Congress can event is eventually changed, or at least minds are changed, to where they'll agree on what to do with No Child Left Behind. And then they can put actual law in place that either keeps Common Core or eliminates Common Core and the, the, the mechanism that makes states take Common Core, or, or you know maybe they decide to do something in between. But I think that's what's ultimately going to change it, is sooner or later, there's got to be a change in Congress where they can agree on how they want to change the law. Neil McCluskey is with the Cato Institute. He is the Associate Director for the Center for Educational Freedom, and uh, he's been our guest talking about uh, Common Core. Mr. McCluskey, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks.